Hi everyone, Drew Brody here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. In today's episode, we have Dr. Roland Griffiths talking to us about psychedelics, psilocybin, and other mood-altering drugs. It's a super fascinating conversation, especially for anyone that's interested in the therapeutic benefits of psilocybin. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Prode. Each week, my team and I will bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and live more. This week's guest is Dr. Roland Griffith, and we're recording this conversation live at the Functional Medicine Annual Conference here in San Antonio, uh, Texas. Dr. Griffith is a professor in the departments of psychiatry and neurosciences at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. His principal research focuses in on both clinical and preclinical laboratories, has been on the behavioral and subjective effect of mood-altering drugs. His research has been largely supported by grants from the National Institute of Health, and he's the author of over 360 journal articles and book chapters. He's been the consultant to the National Institute of Health and to numerous pharmaceutical companies in the development of new psychotropic drugs. He's also currently a member of the Expert Advisory Panel on Drug Dependence for the World Health Organization. He's conducted extensive research with sedative, hypnotics, caffeine, and novel mood-altering drugs. In 1999, he initiated a research program at John Hopkins investigating the effects of classic hallucinogenic psilocybin that includes studies on psilocybin-associated mystical-type experiences in healthy volunteers. Psilocybin facilitated treatment of psychological distress in cancer patients. Psilocybin facilitated treatment of cigarette smoking secession. Psilocybin effects in beginning and long-term meditators and the effects in religious leaders. The Hopkins Laboratory has also conducted a recent series of internet survey studies characterizing the effect of hallucinogenic associated mystical experiences, which we're going to be talking about on the podcast, challenging experiences and effects of substance abuse. Dr. Griffith, thank you for being on the Broken Brain Podcast. My pleasure. Uh, you give a fantastic presentation today at the conference and uh, blew a lot of people's minds on the work that you've been doing now for quite some time. I want to go a little bit more into the origin story because in the uh, presentation, you mentioned that your interest in this field of work uh, started with actually an interest in mindfulness and meditation. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about that and where in your life that was introduced um, as a modality or practice for yourself? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I, I trace that interest back to graduate school where um, there was a <clears throat> visiting meditation teacher that came by and I was intrigued. I was being trained in psychopharmacology, uh, <clears throat> taking physiology and uh, pharmacology and understanding drug effects and, and uh, brain behavior interactions. And it just occurred to me that meditation was a, just a really interesting methodology. I mean, here's a methodology that's been developed over thousands of years for kind of plumbing the internal nature of our experience, our felt experience. And, and so I thought, gee, that, that would be interesting. And I went and took a, a beginning class in meditation and they started teaching about <clears throat> how meditation works and the physiology behind it and, uh, and all kinds of thoughts that didn't, <laughs> that, that didn't come together with anything that I had learned about human physiology or uh, human functioning. And so there, there was this kind of wild disconnect uh, between the understanding that these meditation teachers had about physiology and, and brain science and what I thought and, and, and believed to be true based on, on physiology. But I was able to kind of suspend that and just say, okay, I'm going to take this as a metaphor uh, for how to investigate the nature of mind. And, um, and so dismissed their levels of explanation and just thought I would wade into meditation. Well, turns out meditation is difficult to do. Uh, and it's not uncommon for beginning meditators to find it really uh, 
quite aversive. Uh, and that was exactly the case for me. I sat down to meditate and three minutes felt like three hours. And I, I just, I was out of there uh, within the first week. Um, but nonetheless, curious about what it was that um, our empirical science couldn't teach us about the, the deepest level of consciousness and mind. And then about 20 years ago, I uh, took a meditation practice up again in Baltimore. And for reasons that I don't understand, there's something that clicked this time. And I was able to move into states of consciousness that I hadn't uh, heretofore experienced. And that got me just deeply curious about this whole inner explanation, exploration. At that point, I had already spent oh, <clears throat> over 20 years of my career studying mood-altering drugs and drug effects and changes in uh, subjective effects. Yet there was something unique about the meditation experience and unique about those changes in consciousness. And it was, it was that interest got me reading about different meditation traditions, about different uh, spiritual traditions, about religious practice that had had no interest to me, for me uh, heretofore, uh, uh, that um, drew me into reading about comparative religion and religious experience. And through that connection, I became reacquainted with this older literature on psychedelics and psychedelics were claimed to produce some of those kinds of effects. And here I was a full professor at Hopkins with credentialing in clinical pharmacology. So I, I knew how to study drugs. And so this, you know, the opportunity to study a, a psychedelic and ask questions about the nature of mind and the nature of experience became very compelling to me. And that was our initial study. It was in healthy volunteers. And I have to say that I, <clears throat> I, was, I was pleased with my meditation practice. Um, I was a little bit leery of the claims, frankly, that were made about psychedelics and the psychedelic enthusiasts who seemed to think that this was the answer to so many uh, problems. It just struck me as, uh, as a kind of a suspicious uh, proposition. So, so I went in with a good bit of skepticism, but as the research has unfolded, it's, it's very clear that psychedelics can be a very powerful opening to experiences and states of consciousness that can be accessed in meditation and prayer practice and breath work and drumming in, in all kinds of other uh, modes. And I think these states of consciousness and the kind of resultant consequences of them are, can be profoundly important, both therapeutically and more generally for understanding uh, optimal behavior, ethical and moral values. Give us a little bit of a history lesson. Um, there was some serious medical research at some point in time looking at psychedelics and then things changed. Yeah. You talked a little bit about that. Uh, can you just share with the podcast listeners a little bit of the background on some of the research that was conducted in the space prior to your landmark study? Yeah, so in the 1950s through 60s, <clears throat> early 70s, there were a whole series of studies, many of them with LSD, which is a classic psychedelic, um, <clears throat> some with psilocybin, some with mescaline. Uh, investigating uh, the, this cl class of compounds. There were very therapeutic studies. There were studies uh, looking at LSD in particular and alcoholism and in cancer patients. Some of that, those results looked promising, but, um, but <clears throat> these substances are, are very peculiar to work with because their effects depend really important on context, set and setting. And so depending on how these drugs are administered, what the expectations are, you can get very different kinds of effects. And so it wasn't like conventional clinical pharmacology studying a stimulant or a sedative or an opiate, which has a more narrow window of 
effects. You can get broad and, and variable effects depending on these context variables. So, so <clears throat> the results were, um, uh, were not particularly uh, consistent, or, or although there were suggestions that it was therapeutically helpful. However, uh, that work coincided with the so-called psychedelic 60s, where these drugs became uh, promoted for recreational use, and people like Timothy Leary, who was a well-trained and brilliant uh, psychologist who had worked with psilocybin, uh, decided to leave academia and, and promote uh, recreational or non-medical use of these compounds. And, and that coincided with the anti-establishment movement at the time, the anti-war movement at the time, and it coalesced into this um, fractioning of our culture into uh, you know, a, a pro-drug use and an anti-drug use. And it resulted in, in effect, a demonization of these compounds, an over-representation about their risk, and functionally shut research down for a period of decades. And that's very interesting. But you know, funding uh, you know, was pulled back. These drugs were scheduled under Schedule I stature, so it became very difficult to get them. The academic institutions uh, marginalized them, so it really was an area that fell into academic disrepute to be interested in these compounds. And, and so it resulted in this peculiar situation where these very interesting and novel psychoactive drugs simply didn't get studied for decades. Now, if, if you think about it, and you think about the history of science and how science proceeds, that's astonishing to have, to have three decades in which this really interesting set of compounds you know, is taken away from human clinical pharmacology. And so there it sat in, the, <clears throat> in this um, dormant phase for a long period of time, and then uh, we and others reinitiated this research back in the late uh, 1990s, moving very cautiously into it because there was such a cultural bias against them and the thought that they were so potentially dangerous and harmful, which they turn out not to be, I mean, at least that dangerous and harmful, but, uh, but it's very important to say that they are not without very significant risks. Um, but it, it was that early research, and the most promising applications then were in cancer uh, patients who were depressed or anxious because of a cancer diagnosis, and in treatment of alcoholism. Those were the two most promising uh, indications at the time. Take us back to that when those early conversations were happening in the early 90s of proposing funding to pick back up this research and uh, um, my my uh, business partner and friend, Dr. Mark Hyman, is at the Cleveland Clinic, and I know different hospitals, depending on where people are at and doing their research, you have to go and present to a research board what the idea is. Uh, what were some of the reactions when you told people that this is what you want to pick back up? <laughs> well, it was interesting. It was very mixed. So I, I work in a <clears throat> clinical behavioral pharmacology research unit with colleagues who are, you know, are great scientists interested in... in <clears throat> in pharmacology and, uh, and interactions with behavior and, and subjective effects and behavior change. And what I would say is among my colleagues, there, there was a lot of variance. I can remember presenting this idea, you know, I think I'll give psilocybin to people. And some of my colleagues went, oh, wow, that would be interesting. And others clearly thought, what? You're going to do, why would you do that? Isn't that dangerous? I mean, and, and so there's this kind of cultural dialogue there. And so there are, are, are individuals who are kind of open and curious about that, some of whom have had experience with these compounds, others not, but they're just interested in altered states of consciousness. And other people have, uh, have uh, drunk the Kool-Aid soda, so to speak, they have um, taken in uh, what was this 
uh, you know, public narrative about the dangers of, of these compounds and, and, and believe them. There's no reason that they shouldn't have. So <clears throat> there was variation even among my own colleagues when I took it to our Hopkins Institutional Review Board, that's our ethical review board, they scrutinized it extremely carefully, and as they should have. I mean, that's their, that's their job, is to, is to assess risk-benefit ratio. And they looked at it carefully, they sent it out for external review, they sent it up to the dean of the medical school, they sent it over to the managing attorney's office. But I think to the great credit of Johns Hopkins, on balance, they decided, you know, okay, we can, we assess the risks and benefits and you can proceed cautiously, you know, proceed with the first five volunteers and report back to us if anything un, untoward happens. And, and that's a perfectly reasonable stance, but um, one could easily imagine an institution that doesn't uh, weigh <clears throat> Um, science and rational decision-making as cleanly as Hopkins did and is more prone to making political decisions because the, there, there would have been an institutional risk just because of the history of these compounds that the easy response was not to approve, but it was approved. And then we went to the FDA and they scrutinized the study. They approved it. The DEA approved it. So by 2000, we were approved to move forward to administer a high dose of psilocybin to people who had never previously had a psychedelic. And as best we can tell, such a protocol hadn't been approved for probably 30 years before of that type. <clears throat> tell us a little about that study and some of the <clears throat> early findings that came from doing that research. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's... <laughs> That study was so interesting. So here I am coming into this as someone interested in states of consciousness, interested in meditation, being reasonably skeptical about what these, these drugs do. I was uh, working with a, a close colleague, Bill Richards, who had worked with these compounds previously at, um, at Maryland Psychiatric Research Institute. And so uh, he had, back in the 60s, worked with these compounds. And he, he had the clinical expertise. I had the scientific expertise. I brought in the scientific skepticism. Uh, but <clears throat> very quickly, it became apparent to me that this was, these were effects that were unlike anything I'd seen in clinical pharmacology, having studied, you know, I don't know, 40 or 50 different psychoactive compounds from all different classes. This just read out as something unique. So what was unique about it? Well, <clears throat> one aspect that was unique is that, um, is that uh, people had experiences that map onto naturally occurring mystical or transcendent kinds of experiences that have been described throughout the ages by religious figures or mystics. And, and so that the phenomenology of that is this sense of the interconnectedness of all people and things. It's accompanied by a sense of sacredness and there's a authenticity to it that is more real and more true than everyday waking consciousness. Uh, and, and so there's something unique about that experience that looks like these naturally occurring experiences. So that part was unique, but what was far more interesting than that is interviewing people weeks or months after the experience. And I just can remember how, <clears throat> um, how shocking, frankly, it was to me to sit down the way this first study was designed. Some people had exposure to psilocybin, others to a, a positive control substance. And then we, we interviewed them two months later and then they could get redosed with other, other um, compounds. And just talking to people about the psilocybin uh, experience two months after the experience, and sitting down with someone and saying, so yeah, what, do you, what do you remember of that experience? What was that like for you? And having, having, I can just remember this distinctly, it was the first or second volunteer telling me, you know, that was one of the most meaningful experiences of my life. 
I think of it every day. And I thought, what? I mean, what is this person telling me? I mean, I, you know, I've given all these comments. I've never heard of anyone make an attribution two months afterwards that, you know, they learn something and enduringly so. I mean, if you, if you just think of drug effects generally, um, I mean, take alcohol. You know, someone can have a, an experience of alcohol and if you ask them a week later, oh, what was your experience Saturday night? And, and they'll remember it. They're pulling from memory. Uh, and they might say, oh, it was great. We had a party, you know, I got <laughs> drunk or I got high. It was, you know, uh, and if you ask them two months later, what do you remember? You know, the, the memory's kind of fading, but they haven't, they haven't learned anything that um, informs them prospectively going forward. And these people were saying, no, this is one of the most important experiences of my life. And the, and the first thing I thought is, wait a second, what kind of life experiences do these people have? I mean, <laughs> maybe, they, maybe they've done nothing, you know, but then when probed, you know, they would compare it to say the birth of their firstborn child or death of a parent, something that you go, oh, okay, that's really salient. And that's the level of of reorganization and meaning that gets incorporated into these experiences. So I, I realized right off the bat we were dealing with something pretty astonishing just in terms of the, you know, the human uh, condition. And it just, it just got me deeper and deeper interested in the nature of these experiences. You know, and my, you know, and my first concerns was, well, how much of this is driven by expectation? How much of it you know, is, is driven by the kinds of people we're bringing into this uh, study. Uh, is this real pharmacology, you know? And there are all kinds of controls that you can run, and we, and we did that. And so as we ran further studies, it just got, it just got firmer and firmer that this, was a, this is a real effect, it's an enduring effect. It's, it's fantastically interesting. It relates to something to do with the, uh, the normal human condition because these experiences map onto these naturally occurring kinds of transformative uh, experiences. And so it, it raises all kinds of questions about the evolutionary significance of these experiences, you know, how they work, what's the biology of them and, and how they work, what's the, uh, what are the implications for understanding uh, biological psychiatry and neuroscience, there are all kinds of questions about that. And then what are the therapeutic applications? And there appear to be, you know, very possibly many and very significant therapeutic applications. And then what can these experiences inform us at the kind of the deepest level about the, the human condition, ethics, and morality? Because the core feature of this experience is that that they feature the interconnectedness of all people and things, and that's front and foremost to many of these experiences. And I want to talk about both that and the therapeutic effects coming up, but first I want to just take a step back. Uh, help us understand a little bit about psilocybin. What's happening in the brain when somebody's taking it? Yeah. So, <clears throat> When I sit down and do informed consent with volunteers, <clears throat> I, I very often say, you know, uh, it, it looks like we know a lot about psilocybin and we certainly know a lot more than we did 15, 20 years ago. Um, <clears throat> but our real level of understanding is really quite shallow. So what we know about psilocybin is we know in, uh, with psilocybin and the other classic psychedelics, which include uh, dimethyltryptamine, DMT, which is active in ayahuasca, uh, mescaline, which is active in the peyote cactus used by Native Americans, LSD, which is uh, a man-made hallucinogen or synthesized hallucinogen. What we know is all those drugs have a central site of activity, a share a central site of activity, and that's the serotonin 2A receptor. <clears throat> and that's a uh, a receptor that's widely distributed in human brain, maybe the most common receptor site 
in human brain. It's evolutionarily conserved. It goes back. It's an ancient uh, uh, serotonin is an ancient uh, neurohormonal uh, uh, signaling system in brain. We know where those receptors are in brain from imaging studies, <clears throat> and importantly in, in cortex and in level five of pyramidal cells and cortex, but also in thalamus, claustrum, uh, locus aurelius, uh, in other areas. So we know where, where, where these receptors are. With imaging studies, we know what areas of brain are activated and what areas of brain are deactivated when someone takes psilocybin. And we also know something about connectivity within the brain when someone takes psilocybin. So, you know, the neuroscience of brain and brain network functions have, have worked out different network systems that are active and some of those networks are differentially affected with the psychedelics. And one of the interesting ones is this default mode network, which is claimed to underwrite uh, this self-referential processing, this uh, self-narrative. And, and that default mode network is decreased substantially with psilocybin as it is with LSD. And interestingly, meditators, long-term meditators also show decreases in default mode network functioning. So, so this default mode network, just to interject, sometimes people think of it as like, this is like your ego. That's right. So it's, it, they, it can be described loosely as ego, it's self-referential processing. The way you respond to the world, stim, you know, behavioral patterns. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's your, um, <clears throat> it, it's, it's your uh, default thinking, where your brain goes to when it's given nothing other than to do to just chatter at, at yourself. Uh, and so it's, it's, <clears throat> it may underwrite a narrative function of incoherence of self, and that's decreased. And that kind of ma makes intuitive sense that these drugs bring you into the present moment, that uh, past and present disappear, they collapse into the present moment. And that's exactly what happens in meditation. Um, and and long-term meditators have practiced that. So uh, so that that all makes sense. So so that makes a nice story, but I guess what I want to underscore is it's just a story. Uh, and we and there's so we so poorly understand uh, consciousness. And I and I what I think of is I think these drugs are unique in their capacity to shine a bright light on what it is to be aware, what it is to be conscious. And I think if you, if you think about that, I mean, that's a really profound thing. There's something called the hard problem of consciousness. And, and the hard problem is uh, that it, it may, consciousness may not be reducible to um, reductionistic uh, neuroscience. Uh, it's an open question philosophically and scientifically, although my materialistic oriented colleagues from the sciences would push back on that. They would strongly think of consciousness as an epiphenomena of, of brain network function, but that's, uh, it's not entirely clear. And, uh, and, there, and if you wade into that, uh, philosophical and neuroscience literature, it really becomes uh, quite a puzzle. But there's something, you, and so it's called the hard problems of, of consciousness. And, and right now, it doesn't appear to be sol solvable. It's, it's, it's hard because we don't, we don't even know how to address the questions to answer it. And there's something about these drugs that shine a light on that experience of what it is to be aware that we're aware. And if, I mean, it, and if, you, if you think a little bit about that, I mean, it really is quite astonishing. I mean, here we are, these highly evolved creatures. We're sentient creatures, and we can navigate the world, and we you know, can feel things, we can move things, we can think, we can deal with abstractions, we can make mental constructions, solve puzzles. Uh, and beyond all that, we are aware that we're aware. And that's, 
why, why, and why, why would that even be the case? Why would you need to have that? What function does that serve? And as you lean into that question, awareness of awareness, you're really confronted with the, the um, I think it's the deepest existential question of what it is to be conscious. What is it, what is, is it about our experience of sentience? Because that, it's, it's actually the only thing that we actually know for certain. That's the only thing we can validate. You can validate that you're aware that you're aware. You can't validate that in me. You can't know that in me. Um, and, and that's a starting point. Uh, and and it, it, it just brings up this, the, you know, the deep question of, wait a second, what, what is this really about? I'm, I'm in this astonishing opportunity, consciousness. I'm, I'm in this playground of being. How the hell did I get here? What does this mean? You're probably there too. <laughs> and, and that's the, that's the interconnectedness, the kind of the recognition that we're, that we're all in, as one of our long-term meditators said that I thought was cute, we're all in the same pickle. It's like we all have the same uh, dilemma, but it connects us in a, in a really profound way. And it's, and it's deeply humbling. And I think it's what we all want to know more than anything, at least what I want to know more than anything is, yeah, what is this about? Yeah, what happens when we die? Yeah, what is the nature of this experience? And and where and where's it going? And so that and, and these are the these are the questions that are, are raised by that. And when and when you raise those questions with people, and if they haven't thought about those, it it can be an existential shock. I mean, they're pulled out of their narrative frame. You know, all of their worries for the moment and what they're trying to achieve and they want to get a new job or buy a car. You know, they're concerned about all the mundane things in life. And yet, we're all sitting in this much bigger, you know, question that is nothing more than absolutely astonishing in the magnitude of the mystery that it, that it raises. And it, therein, it, you know, it speaks to some people who are comfortable using you know, religion and spiritual language, because it's the mystery, but you don't have to go there. You can just go into the absolute mystery of, of what it's about. But, but with these kinds of experiences and with the kinds of shifts that can come about in self-narrative because of that, there can be, you know, profoundly positive changes, both for people who are suffering from, you know, classic, medical or psychiatric conditions. Depression, other anxieties. Depression, anxiety, yeah, behavioral addictions of all sorts. Uh, but also more broadly for the, for the human experience, because we're all in the same pickle. In fact, in your research, there's, uh, you have the mystical survey. Uh, what's the formal title of it? The mystical? Mystical experience survey. Mystical experience survey. And even people who, uh, that you did research on that weren't uh, dealing with uh, some sort of addiction, um, cigarette cessation, cancer, uh, there are just, you know, no issues. Um, a reportedness of, uh, you know, a deeply positive mood that was reported, mm -hmm. uh, a sense of transcendence of space and time, a sense of we're all one, that maybe we're all looking through the same experience, mm -hmm. that maybe we're not separate in in a way that we see ourselves as separate always and those are profoundly impactful ways of navigating your core sense of identity in the world you know i mean i'm sure there's all sorts of implications of how does that change somebody's life when they start to understand and ask these bigger questions of what's important what's not important what deserves attention what doesn't what does not deserve attention um did you uh have any sense that these experiences would be that level of um, that level of depth? Like, had you had any psychedelic experiences yourself to know that? Okay, I have somewhat of a sense of what people might experience. 
uh, going through um, these doses of psilocybin. Let's see, I, I had had no personal informative experience that would have led me to believe <clears throat> that psychedelics did what they can do. I mean, my guiding experiences initially were through, uh, through meditation. But, but if, you, if you look carefully at the literature and the nature of these experiences, it's clear that this is, isn't just about psychedelics. This is about the capacity of the human organism to have transformative experiences, and they can be occasioned under any number of different circumstances, like meditation or breath work or prayer practice or drumming, or just, you know, out, just human experiences. Yeah, just spontaneously, very often experiences. If you if you look back at the history of religious experience and and spontaneous mystical experiences, there are lots of accounts of people who had such experiences, you know, really uh, un, unbeckoned and, you know, they, they just occurred. They're walking on the beach one night and all of a sudden, and they'll describe these experiences with the qualities that we have. You know, um, Bill Wilson, who founded Alcoholics Anonymous, had such an experience when he was going under alcohol detox and it was the basis of that experience that he, he founded AA. And, you know, that's the 12 step uh, program for treating alcoholics. Fully six of the 12 steps has something to do with higher power, recognizing higher power, surrendering to higher power. And that, and, and that is, you know, a, akin to just the astonishment of the magnitude of the mystery. In a way, what you're saying is, the way that I'm understanding it, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that this is less about psychedelics and psilocybin and more of a reflection of what the human mind is capable of, these experiences that are happening regularly for all of us, and how under a microscope, so to speak, we can use psychedelics, psilocybin, you know, we can use these mood-altering drugs to sort of see what the mind is capable of. Exactly. So it's right. not to get attached, because if you think that it's this outside thing, then there becomes a dependency or a focus on this outside thing instead of this internal thing that can be developed through a, a various sorts of methods. Correct, yeah, I, and I think that's, that's um, really important. Um, <clears throat> Alan Watts, who wrote about psychedelics back in the 1960s, had a, a saying, or was alleged to have said, when you, when you get the message, hang up the phone. And what he was saying there is that's about psychedelics. It's not about the psychedelics. It's about the message. And, and, and my thought is that people who use psychedelics as a path uh, and become attached to that as the only way to open is that just closes down and it, it constrains what they can become with it because it's not about psychedelics. It's uh, one confusing of, yourself with the vehicle that you drive in. Exactly. As right. a friend of ours, Peter Crone, who came on the podcast recently said, are you, is it you? You know, what are you using the vehicle for? You're not the car. You're just using it for a temporary purpose. Yeah. So, yeah, I think Ram Dass had the expression uh, when, yeah, when you're already in Philadelphia, you don't need a bus to get there. I mean, so it's, <laughs> it's not that it's, that it's a vehicle. But, you know, importantly to this and to the whole issue of set and setting is the contextualization of these experiences and then what people do with those experiences. So, you know, in the 1960s, there were lots of particularly younger kids that took LSD and other uh, psychedelics. And, you know, some of them had astonishing experiences and changed life course, but many of them didn't. And, and, and some of them were harmed by those experiences. But if, if, if just laid on someone, these experiences can be confusing, they're, they're difficult to integrate, they don't have meaning. And so a lot of it is contextualization of the experience and, and trying to get traction with them about what the meaning is for changing one's narrative in life. And Part of what you presented today at the conference here, which is focused on addiction, stress, pain management, is the therapeutic benefits 
because of course there's this spiritual component and there's some people that are dealing with um hard hard wiring in their default mode pathways in their brain which can cause addiction which, which can have pain if they're uh um they're very far stage in, in, in a cancer or other things, fear, extreme fear, anxiety of, of passing away. Can you talk a little about the about psychedelics and the potential for treating uh, conditions in, in a therapeutic way and some of the studies that you've done? Maybe we could start off with uh, the addiction and uh, smoking, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. Yeah. So I think it's, I think it is important that the, the, uh, the wisest, uh, and most important use right now is for therapeutics, because if, if we're gonna if we're gonna make if we're gonna really un, unpack these compounds, understand how they work, uh, they have to engage the culture at some meaningful level, and therapeutics is I, I think the le legitimate avenue into that. And these are very powerful uh, <clears throat> compounds to approach therapeutic questions. So, so the two big areas that came out of the earlier studies were addictions and, and then anxiety, depression, secondary to life-threatening illness. So in terms of addictions, <clears throat> we have looked at psilocybin for treatment of uh, tobacco dependence, cigarette smoking addiction, and uh, that's being done with, with by my colleagues at Hopkins, Matt Johnson and Albert Garcia Romeo. And what we showed was uh, in an initial pilot study of just 15 volunteers that psilocybin in combination with um, cognitive behavior therapy uh, produced immediate and long duration abstinence from cigarette smoking. So it, six months we had 80% abstinence rate biologically verified, which is unheard of in the cigarette smoking area. Cigarette smoking is one of the most difficult to treat addictive disorders uh, there are. Um, and, and so um, combining this with the intention to quit and the support involved produces these long-term enduring effects. There's um, uh, we're going on to do comparative efficacy trial with comparing psilocybin with nicotine replacement to look at that more closely. There's other work in the addictions going on right now at NYU with psilocybin and treatment of alcohol dependence. And there's a small study going on with treatment of cocaine dependence uh, with psilocybin. Um, so all three of those have appear to be promising and it, and it fits with the <clears throat> older studies and this idea that um, these experiences can help rewrite narrative and, and self-understanding in a way that can be very therapeutically helpful. So if you think about it, someone, someone who's addicted to cigarette smoke, smoking you know, will come in and they'll say, you know, I'm a lifelong smoker. I've tried multiple times to quit. I've tried varenicline and nicotine replacement and cold turkey. I always lapse uh, and I'm, I'm addicted. And that's their <clears throat> history and that's their story. And, um, and with these kinds of experiences, the experiences are, are so wide and so big uh, that it appears to pull people out of that narrative. So they're, they're no longer attached to just this locked in, uh, fused idea that they're addicted. They can see the capacity to do otherwise. They can tolerate craving and discomfort in a way that they didn't think was heretofore possibly possible. They can reset life priorities in a way consistent with uh, with quitting. So it's really quite astonishing uh, what can happen. And we don't understand fully at the network level uh, what, what's going on there. I'm, I'm, I'm framing it in terms of, of meaning and psychology and cognitive processes, but undoubtedly there's something going on at network functioning brain levels that, that we don't yet understand. The other big application is 
<clears throat> in anxiety, depression, secondary to life-threatening uh, illness. And so we did a study at, that was published concurrently with a study at uh, NYU in cancer patients who were anxious or depressed because of their cancer diagnosis. And we compared a pretty large dose of psilocybin to a very, very low dose of psilocybin in our trial. And again, we show that psilocybin produces these mystical type experiences, but uh, with these, this transformative quality. But the important point here is that all our measures of clinical distress, that is our classic measures of depression and anxiety, go way down. Uh, you know, so much so that uh, about 90% of people five weeks after treatment uh, showing clinically significant responses and about 60% are in complete remission. That is, they don't have any trace of anxiety. And, uh, <clears throat> and, that, and that holds out to, out to six months. So that's, that's actually fantastically interesting. And it's really unprecedented within psychiatry if you think about it. I mean, this is a, a single session that lasts, you know, six hours at Johns Hopkins that is producing these enduring effects out to, out to six months in a very clinically significant psychiatric condition. So psychiatry doesn't have interventions of that sort. Certainly what we know, you know, the antidepressants, for instance, take may take weeks to work unless it's ketamine that can work m more quickly, but its effects die out really quickly. Uh, and uh, antidepressants aren't very effective. Uh, psychiatry has in very severe cases of depression, uh, ECT, uh, electroconvulsive brain stimulation. Um, that's a, you know, a pretty crude, but very powerful intervention. But that takes multiple sessions, and it it wanes over time. Its efficacy isn't isn't particularly sustained. So what we have is a model here of a discrete intervention that produces these dramatic and enduring effects within psychiatry, and and, and, and frankly, it looks more like a surgical intervention mm. than it does you know a psychiatric intervention. Uh, you know, in surgery, you might expect to go in and have a, a hip replacement and, and be quite functional, you know, enduringly thereafter. Uh, and, 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 and that may be the metaphor uh, for what these kinds of interventions can bring to psychiatry. Now, to what extent they're effective in different, for different medical indications is still open for investigation. And what would you like to see happening in the space for the research that's needed to really, I mean, there's people that are listening at home. Some people have had <coughs> their own experiences with psychedelics, some positive, but also some negative. And I want to talk about some of the challenges and the risks that are there for uh, some individuals that you saw, even in your own studies. Um, what would you want to see in terms of all this promise? You mentioned that there are two companies that are working on a, that have been approved by the FDA, I believe. <coughs> that are, uh, have the ability to begin the first stage of uh, working on drugs that are based on this. Um, what, what do we need more of in this space? Is it just really we need a lot more money in the space for research to see and uh, take out there? Do we need <clears throat> governmental policies to change the classifications on, on, on these things to get the research that we need? Because mm -hmm. there's so mm -hmm. much promise and what's an impediment to the promise just as there was the dark ages before you came in with your research. How do we support the future of this? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, that's a big question because there are so many different directions to go. So if we just take therapeutics, uh, w yeah, what do we need? We have two companies that have <clears throat> initial approval to initiate these clinical trials, and, and those need to go forward. We need to see how that... Um, that shakes out whether efficacy is sustained under those uh, very tightly monitored conditions. I, I, my guess is that it will be that these are going to going to be effective. But um, 
until you run those trials and <clears throat> look at uh, rates of efficacy and rates of adverse events, you don't know for certain. But I, I would have some optimism that those initial indications, which are targeted at either treatment-resistant depression or major depression, are likely uh, provable indications. <clears throat> and then there are a variety of other indications. And so we talked about the addictions, uh, and that might be promising future indications. But there may be a vast number of other uh, therapeutic um, <clears throat> indications. So we're initiating studies in anorexia nervosa and early Alzheimer's. There are a number of other clinical targets that we would, we would like to look at. Uh, um, but all, all of those just need to be investigated and they, then they need to go through the, uh, the regulatory and scientific gauntlet that is required to get a medication approvable in, uh, you know, in, our, in our culture. So that's one area of, of critical importance. There's a whole lot that we need to understand about the basic science of how these work. So there's <clears throat> a lot of basic work to be done in terms of pharmacology and, and, uh, and neuroscience, uh, trying to understand the underlying mechanisms and what it is that accounts for both the acute effects and the enduring effects. And there's much that we, we don't understand about that. <laughs> there's, in terms of drug, drug policy, the fact that these drugs are Schedule I compounds, which means that they're the most tightly regulated compounds, creates a huge barrier to research, not only clinical research, but all basic science research, because one has to get special levels of approval to obtain the compound and it has to be monitored very closely and that's and that is a impediment to conducting uh, even uh, the very basic neuroscience you know preclinical neuroscience with these compounds so th so some of that structure needs to uh, relax or be changed in a way to allow the science to move forward so I want to go back to origin story a little bit. As a child, was there a fascination about what's real and not real? You know, so much of science is, you know, looking at and, and like pushing one thing and how does one thing react? Was there any fascination with like the nature of reality? Were these, these questions that you were asking yourself as a, as a young man or as a child that you think were part of what ultimately led to this fascination of first the meditation and then ultimately the space of mood, mood altering and mind altering drugs? Well, it, it's a good question, and, and I can't, <clears throat> let's see, I can't point to uh, my own personal stories of kind of grappling with those mm, deep existential questions, other than those that I suppose every child has to have when they sleep outside for the first time and look up into the stars and realize Wait a second. This goes on forever. What does that mean? How does that work? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then and then you cease to. And I I cease to think about that. And so I I think uh, you know, I, and I didn't have a religious upbringing. I you know I went to church occasionally. It wasn't an important focus uh, for my family. I ended up flunking out of confirmation class <laughs> in six. <laughs> in sixth grade. Um, but, I, you know, I would have to say, going back to my kind of curiosity about meditation in graduate school, that yeah, there's this deeper curiosity about what it is that we know and don't know about our inner lives. Um, and so that, that was there in background, but I would have to imagine that wouldn't that be part of the human condition? Isn't that everyone's backstory at some level? Maybe not. Maybe so. I can't imagine it being otherwise, though, because <laughs> those are the most fundamental um, experiences that we have as conscious beings trying to figure out what this world's about. It just gets papered over so quickly as we get enmeshed in 
culture and in story and attached to um, <clears throat> identity. Uh, and uh, and at least in our culture, then getting attached to uh, grasping for uh, recognition or achievement or, you know, financial gain or social prestige or, you know, however that uh, that comes out. <clears throat> There's people that are listening to this interview. You were featured in Michael Pollan's uh, re most recent book. And inside of there, he was very open about how he went essentially underground and started working with uh, certain healers and doctors in this field <clears throat> who would be anonymous inside of his book who are helping him go through these experiences and people who have also had those experiences with psilocybin or other um, modalities that are out there. And, and there's people that are listening to this interview and looking at the horizon like, okay, well, I'm suffering with this right now or I'm dealing with this component or I have my own personal interest in having some of the same experiences of individuals out there. Um, and we know that that's part of the dialogue. What would be the conversation that you'd have for them uh, about their own interest and experiments uh, on their own and potential side effects that or, or, or downsides that can come with that. Yeah, so <clears throat> what, what I, I'm concerned about the <clears throat> kind of renewed and enth cultural enthusiasm about these drugs, that the downside and the risks aren't downplayed because they are there and they're very significant. So. <clears throat> we ran a large-scale survey study of people reporting in great detail about their most difficult or challenging experience with psilocybin. And this survey took um, over about an hour to complete, so people weren't completing it just on a whim. They, they felt impelled to uh, uh, complete it. Now, they were talking about their worst experiences, but this was 2,000 people. <clears throat> and what was sobering about that was that 10% of them said that they put themselves or others at risk because they engaged in dangerous behavior. 3% uh, ended up seeking medical help. But um, I think m most disturbing to me is that about 10% of people whose experience occurred over a year ago continued to report enduring psychiatric problems, depression or anxiety that they attributed to the experience. So I think I think it's uh, it's just very important to recognize that in unselected volunteers, I mean we screen our volunteers very carefully, and so we're not going to admit anyone who we think uh, would have a vulnerability to having problems. Uh, and um, <clears throat> and so so, but in unselected volunteers with unknown doses in conditions that aren't supported these experiences can go awry and they can be damaging and enduringly so. Uh, Especially in sort of like recreational <clears throat> no, places absolutely. where there's other drugs or narcotics that might be there or stimulants or... Oh, yeah, and people don't know what they're taking and uh, something's gonna be passed off as psilocybin and it's not, it's something else. Some of these are, can be very toxic poisons, but even with pure psilocybin, you're going to end up with casualties, either acute casualties, deaths, you know, from engaging in dangerous behavior, or, or you very well may end up with permanent psychotic conditions in people who are vulnerable to schizophrenia, for instance, and maybe this is just enough to push them over into uh, a, a schizophrenic process that is Ir irreversible. Um, so I think we, we have to be very cautious and, and, and sober uh, about this. I think what I would say to people who are interested in the exploration of consciousness is they needn't turn to psychedelic drugs. There are other alternatives. There is meditation. There is breath work. There's all, you know, there are a whole variety of ways of investigating the nature of, of consciousness. If the opportunity arises to <clears throat> participate in a, some of the studies, for instance, we conduct where people are really tightly screened and prepared and uh, supported during the sessions and after sessions, then I think people would find that uh, 
really valuable. Uh, but I guess I would want uh, people to be patient. Uh, and, uh, and I'm an advocate for getting these um, compounds approved through our medical system uh, and, and in, into the, injected into culture in a, in a fashion that's going to be uh, controlled and safe and then letting it unfold from there. And I think it's quite probable that it will. <clears throat> Dr. Griffin, thank you so much for being on our podcast. For those that want to follow your work and continue to see the research that John, Hops John Hopkins is doing and, uh, and potentially even be supportive in the efforts, uh, where would you have them uh, look to continue to stay on the up and up of what I consider to be one of the most fascinating parts of medicine today that really has a lot of potential in the future. How can people be a part of it? Uh, where can they follow the work? Oh, well, thank you for asking. So we do have um, a, a, a center uh, and, uh, at Johns Hopkins, uh, at least a, um, a, a group of investigators that are working with psilocybin, and I can provide you the link to And we'll uh, put in the that. show notes. That'd be great. Thank you so much. I know you have a flight to catch. I so appreciate you coming on the Broken Brain Podcast. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you.